Welcome everyone to reading the scripture, the Aramaic, Pshita, the New Testament in the original first century Aramaic language. And every month we'll try to read one chapter from each book of the New Testament. Of course, we're starting with the book of Matthew. And today I'm going to give you only a general idea what is the project about and what do I mean by the pshita, by the original, original scripture, by the original uh, Bible. The pshita is a word derived from the Aramaic Syriac language, peshita. Peshita literally means the simple virgin or the simple lunga franca. In Hebrew, pashut, the root, pashut, and also the same in Aramaic, it's simple. In other words, we can also translate the pshita, something like common. What do I mean by common? It is something that is used with all the people. It's a common among the people. Which people? Of the first century. Also, pshita can mean straightforward or direct, which means the direct translation of the first century Aramaic scripture, the simple language. And Aramaic have, every word have different meanings. But I want to tell you that simplicity is the key of approaching the Aramaic Bible, the Pshita. And I want to tell you, for this course, you need to open your heart because Aramaic language and Hebrew is different than the Greek translations. And the Aramaic speaks to the heart. The Greek is for the intellectual people. They don't use their heart much, they use their minds. Now it's not wrong or right, it's a perspective. I'm not saying that the Aramaic is better than the Hebrew or is better than the Greek, no. It's a different approach of way of thinking. I'm gonna give you the differences between the Aramaic and Hebrew and the Greek way of thinking. Now, Aramaic is to grab hold and understand the language depth, not only from your mind, but with your heart, there is a balance. The Greek uses their minds more than their hearts. So we need to balance both of them. The Greek language is a very beautiful language. It's very expressive language. It's for intellectual persons. And for intellectual persons from a Greek perspective, Greek gods, how they think, they need to control. They always fear to lose control, the fear of losing the opposite, the Aramaic way of thinking, we give it all because we know with God, we cannot control anything. So when the Greeks translated scripture to the Greek language, they got rid of all the Aramaic. They tried to put on fire all other scriptures in Hebrew because they wanted to control. But the churches in the East, the Aramaic churches preserved it inside the priests and the early church preserved it because of persecution. So the Aramaic, it's about the moment. You cannot own anything. And you go and let it like free. You set free. You let it go from your heart, but not from your mind. Of course, we're going to use our minds. It's important. But we're going to focus more about the heart. I want you to think like the Aramaic Shita, the Bible, is like a song from your heart. When you are happy, what you do? You have joy. And when you have joy, what you do? You sing. Aramaic is yourself. 
singing nice tones or rhythms. This is the language. And it's about the community, about us. It's an expression of unconditional love, the language. For example, I'm going to give you some Aramaic words. Hobo. Hobo means love. This is the love language. Rahmani in Aramaic is mercy, merciful. Shbak in Aramaic is forgiveness. So when you hear these words, you hear the songs of your heart. It touches your heart. It's compassion. It's not only intellectual. The Greek is intellectual because the Greek is connected later with Latin, all right? They come from one family language. You can say that the Greek in the West is masculine, is strong, is rational, pragmatic, scientific, exclusive. A language that is very unique, it's precise. So that's the Greek language. It's so beautiful too. But the Aramaic is feminine. Despite it's a forgotten language, based completely on a different and unfamiliar point of view. And I want to tell you that the Aramaic language is a language that is empathic, that is poetic. The pshita, what we're going to read, is a spiritual-based, exclusive language. It's feminine. It's a visionary. It's the language of the prophet. That's the concept of Aramaic and Hebrew. Because in Greek, you can find one, two, three meanings of words. But all the time, you get to a point to one word. In Greek, when you explain scripture, you go back to one perspective, unique, precise understanding of the word. For example, namos, the law in Greek, all right? And that's the translation to English is the law. I'm giving you one example of what I'm saying. And when you explain about the law in a Greek way of thinking, the law, you think that God is a judge. When we say the word law, you think you are in a court. And there is punishment. That's the Greek. It's masculine. But with the Aramaic, the law doesn't mean law in the Bible and Hebrew. It's the same word Torah. Torah means life. You see, it's more feminine. It's more uh, approachable. It's more from the heart. You serve God because of Torah, because of life. So the word Torah, the word law, is Aramaic, Torah. And in Greek, it's law. So in Hebrew and Aramaic, it's much more easier, much more spiritual, much, much more like uh, relational. So Aramaic have several layers of meanings, up to five, six, and even seven layers leads to completion. So when we go with Aramaic, we're going to go deeper into layers because it's all about relationships and everyone can give interpretation. It's open. Why? Because it's about the community. It's relational. And the community, it embraces all our hearts together rather than the Greek that divides because it's individualistic. So when it's all about interpretations and traditions and prophecy therefore it's completely related to our hearts so this is completely different than the west think and i want to stretch you a little bit aramaic is the language of the angels a language of empathy and prophecy and the language of symbols and emblems and idioms and signs and metaphors. It's more even than the Hebrew in metaphors. And me, that all means it's related to the community to give the interpretation, the deep interpretation. 
which we will go to the root words. We're going to be reading from the New Testament, first from the book of Matthew, and we're going to understand verses from the original Aramaic. And what's going to happen to you, because of the depth of the language, there will be a revelation of the heart of God for you personally to walk with him deeper. And one more comment. The Aramaic language do not distinguish between the mental, the physical, the emotional, the spiritual. It's all become together functioning for the revelation of Torah, for the revelation of the word of God. Because we are created all together, soul, spirit, and body. It's so important to understand that. Now, I'm going to get you now to history and get you some facts about the Pshita, the book that we are reading from. And I'm going to go back to the time of the early church fathers. From the early 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, we hear about Bishop Epiphanos. We hear about the early church father, St. Jerome. We hear about another bishop by the name Papias. And I don't know if you heard about... Bishop Origenus, the early church father, even Eusebius, who lived in Caesarea, and Clermont of Alexandria, he was a very important uh, a church. Uh, Clermont of Alexandria was very important, like a uh, church leader in Egypt. And there is more, but I can name a few of them that referred and constantly quoted from the book, the original Pshita, that was written in Aramaic. So in the fourth, third century, they knew what they had. And this Pshita, the Aramaic, circulated among the first Christians. And they had other titles for that book, which was called the Gospel of the Hebrews, or the Gospel of the Twelve, or the Gospels of the Nazarene. That's the original, original scripture. And later, it was known as the Aramaic Gospel. And according to Matthew, and is thought to be the source that laid the basis for most of the other Gospels from that time. I'll give you a historical evidence. Bishop Papias, around 60 to 130 AD, which is like, uh, we can say 50 years, 40 years after Jesus, he was a bishop of Heli Heliopolis in Greece, in Asia Minor. He tells that Matthew wrote his gospel in the Peshitta Aramaic. All right? So that's the words of the bishop at that time. And we are sure, scholars, that an Aramaic version of the gospel of the book of Matthew has been known to the Jews from the beginning of the second century. We have a copy in the library of the rabbinical college in Tiberias, in, in the Sea of Galilee, of that book, Aramaic. And in the third century, there is another copy was in the library of Caesarea, with Bishop Eusebius speaks about it. And San Jerome in the fourth century also, he says that the Nazarenes of Aleppo in Syria also had a manuscript of the Aramaic Matthew, and which was allowed to have copies of it. Even Eusebius, around 275 to 339, describes the 12 apostles as, look what the sentence he said, quite common men with knowledge of the tongues as Assyrians. What do you mean Assyrians? Means Aramaic. So after Jesus gives the disciples the great commission and to preach his message to all over the world, Eusebius has them. And he said also in another comment, how can we do it? How, pray, can we preach to the Romans? We are men bred up to use the Syrian tongue only, which is the Aramaic tongue. What language can we speak to the Greeks? So this helps us to understand that Eusebius means that the math, book of Matthew wrote his Gospels originally in Aramaic. And look what he, state, he states. 
for Matthew, who had at first preached to the Hebrews, when he was about to go to other peoples, committed his gospel to writing in his native tongue. You can read this from the book of Eusebius, Ecclesiastical History, book number three. Look what it says. The gospel to writings in his native tongue. So the Lunga Franca, the native tongue of all the disciples, was Aramaic. They were speaking, of course, Hebrew and, of course, some Greek. But the main language of the daily use was Aramaic. So Bishop Eusebius make it very clear that the apostles spoke Aramaic so obviously. He refers to that. And Eusebius, who is the source and very important early church father, was convinced that Jesus and the apostles also spoke Aramaic. And he had information available to him that we no longer possess today. That was the nearest to the time of Jesus, like only two centuries later. But anyway, let us go and give you also a general view about the book of Matthew. What is the book of Matthew? Because if we want to understand Jesus, Yeshua Amshicho in Aramaic. If we want to understand Yeshua Amshicho the Nazarene, we have to make effort to understand the original Peshitta Bible, the Aramaic. Because Aramaic was the essential part of the language of Jesus and his disciples. Because if we understand the culture, the custom, and the context, I am really positive that you're gonna gain so much treasures of the words of Jesus and the phrases of Jesus that he said in the New Testament. So as a foundation, I'm using the Peshitta of the New Testament with the English translation. Now we know out of the four gospels that the book of Mark is believed to be written first, okay? Then Matthew is the second gospel. Of course, Luke, and then the end is John. And many critics have tried to suggest that it was written around 37 AD. So that is only, the tradition says, it's not more than 20 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. So Matthew was an eyewitness of the events that took place at that time of history. Matthew's book and his emphasis is to declare to the Jews that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy and that he is the king of the Jews. He attempts Matthew through all the gospel to show that the kingdom of God is an eternal kingdom under the reign of their Messiah, Yeshua and Shiho. So, it's no wonder that the gospel, Matthew, starts with a lineage that goes back all the way through the line of David, all the way to Abraham, all the way to the book of Genesis. And these are two important men, David and Abraham, when we connect to the lineage of Jesus. These are the two men who God made promises concerning their descendants. Of Abraham, it was promised that through his seed, a descendant, the entire world would be blessed. That's written in Genesis twenty-two eighteen, 18. And David also is a continuation of that blessings received the promise that and, uh, through him will come also the Messiah. So from verses 1 to 16, it speaks about the genealogy. And before reading this, I want to explain for you about the genealogy and what does it mean. And I want to tell you, in ancient cultures, when they write a genealogy, it's not like the Greeks or like the West you think today. You have to write every generation. No. In the East, the mindset, when you write a genealogy, you write it for a reason. You write the most important figures and the most important people in that and it's not about to be precise as i said not like the greek 
And also I want you to be careful when it gets to generations and generations. And like uh, if it's mentioned in the Old Testament, I'll give you one example that uh, Moses lived for 730 years or Noah sir, lived for 930 years. You have to understand that these 730 years or 930 years is a generational thing to their time of history. It's not their age. So you have to be careful when it gets to genealogy because that is the ancient way of thinking, the ancient way of writing genealogy is not to be precise, is to cause scholars in the West to be confused and don't know the answer. The record like you think. It will line are complete. So Matthew is making it clear through the bloodline and make it complete. So genealogies were very important to the Jewish people. We have a lot of records found in archaeology in Bethlehem about genealogy, in Nazareth, even in Jordan. And we learned a lot of these writings because kings had to come from the lineage of Judah, right? And priests have to prove their lineage back to the Levites. So genealogy is important in Hebraic and Aramaic mindset. Because here is Matthew, he want to tell us that Jesus was from the Messiah. Matthew wanted his readers to understand exactly right off that Jesus was descendants from Abraham and David, the Davidic dynasty. This was the foundation for everything followed up. So let me now share the screen with you and start to read scripture from the original Aramaic. And then I will continue my interpretation. So here I have a website and on that website we have so many translations. I won't confuse you because there are so many translations, the Greek translation, the Aramaic and all that, but I'm using the Pshita translation for Dr. George Lamsa. There's another Pshita translation for Dr. John W. Etheridge, but I don't recommend because he learned Aramaic from the, someone from the East, but he was not precise. He's, not, he's a Westerner. Dr. James Marduk, he's done a good job, but not precise. Dr. George Lamsa, English Pshita, is, is what I'm going to use because this is the most nearby and I chose the, remember there are so many different Aramaic dialects. I chose the Serto Jerusalem dialect. That's the first century dialect of, uh, of Jesus. Jesus had the Galilean Serto, but, but this is uh, very nearby. And I'm gonna read first about the genealogy. And what I'm gonna do, we're gonna start reading Aramaic slowly and do the English translation. And I'm gonna read from one, all the way through all the genealogy and then explain more points about what we have been reading. So I want you to hear the Aramaic. So I will start from Matthew verse, chapter one, verse one. Ktaba did li dote di Yeshua mshiho bra di Dawood Bra de Abraham. All right, in English, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You see, Matthew made it straightforward through this genealogy to reach a point that Jesus is the Messiah from priestly descendants. Matthew. Verse two. <clears throat> Abraham ulad le Ishaq. Ishaq ulad le Ya'ub. Ya'ub ulad le Yehuda. Ula achohi. I love it. I love it. I know the meaning so well. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Verse 3. Yehuda ulad lefars walizrach men tamar 
راس اولاد لخسرون وخسرون اولاد لارام I love this verse because Aram is from the Arameans who came from So let's read the English for you. Judah of Perez and Zera of his wife Tamar. Perez begotten Hezron. Hezron begotten Aram. Aram. Here is mentioned the descendants of the Aramaic Arameans. Verse 4. Aram. Again, here is Aram. Olaf Reish Mim. Aram. Olad Li'ami Nadab. عامل الداب أولاد لنحشون نحشون أولاد لسلمون In English أرام بيجات أبي نداب أبي نداب بيجات نحشون and نحشون بيجات سلمون It's so beautiful verse five سلمون أولاد لبوعز من رحاب رحاب بعاز أولاد لعبيد من رعوث من رعوث أولاد لشاي سلمون بيجات بوعز of his wife رحاب بوعز بيجات أبيد of his wife روث and Obed begot J.C. Here is, we're coming to David, right? And by the way, Obed, Nabi Obed, is a village today nearby Bethlehem. We know the location. It comes the birthplace of this prophet, what I'm reading. Obed and his son, J.C. And then David, all right? So we are getting nearby geographically in the area of Bethlehem. Verse 6. Ishai, Ulad, the Dawid. Who's Dawid? David. Malkan. Malkan is king, all right? Dawid, Ulad, Lishilmon, Min Anta Dawriya. Jesse begot David, the king. David, the king, begot Solomon of the wife of Oreya. Verse 7. Shlimon. أولاد لرحبعام ورحبعام أولاد لأبيا أبيا أولاد لآسا Let's read the English one now. Solomon begotten رحبعام رحبعام begotten أبياجا أبياجا begotten آسا Now, verse 8. This is Olaf, this is Samkat, this is Olaf. Asa, Ulad, Le Yehoshaphat. Yehoshaphat, Ulad, Le Yoram. Yoram, Ulad, Le Ozia. Asa begat Yehoshaphat, Yehoshaphat begat Joram, Joram begat Ozia. And verse 9 Ozia. أولاد ليوتام يوتام أولاد لأخاز أخاز أولاد لحزقيا وزيا بيجات جوثام جوثام بيجات أحاز أحاز بيجات حزقيا you know whom حزقيا right which we're gonna talk about it Matthew verse ten حزقيا أولاد لمناسى Menasse, Ulad li Lamon, Lamon, Ulad lo Yoshia. Verse 10 Hezekiah begat Menasse, Menasse begat Amon, and Amon begat Josiah. And verse 11 Yoshia, Ulad li Konia, li Konia, Ula Ahu he Blogata de Babel. Josiah begat Jehokania and his brothers about the captivity of Babylon. Verse 12. Min tar glota din de Babel. Yokniya ulad le shtatil. Shtatil ulad le zuru 
Babel. And after the captivity of Babylon, Johakania begat Shealatil, Shealatil begat Zuru Babel. Verse 13. Zerubabel, Ulad le Abiod. Abiod, Ulad le Eliakim. Eliakim, Ulad le Azur. And by the way, you see the Aramaic pronunciation of the words is different than the English. I pronounce exactly in the Aramaic Hebraic pronunciation. Zerubabel begat Ubayad. Obayad begat Eliakim, Eliakim begat Azor. Verse 14, we're going to finish till 16 and explain more things. Verse 14, Azor Olad le Zaduk. Zaduk Olad le Akin. Akin Olad le Aliud. Azor begat Tado. Tadok begat Achim. Achim begat Eliud. Verse 15, Eliud Ulad le Azar. Al Azar Ulad le Matin Ulad le Akub. Verse 15, Eliud begat El Azar, El Azar begat Methan, Methan begat Jacob. Now 16, Yaqub Ulad le Yusuf. Now this is very important. Yaqub Ulad Le Yusuf. Jbara de Mariam de Mane et lad Yeshua de Mektra Mshiho. Okay, this is very important. Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Mshiho in Aramaic is Christ. So, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to tell you more about the verse I read 16. Yaqub, Ulad, Le Yusuf, Jacob, came then Joseph, and then through Miriam came Yeshua Amshiho. So you see here, Matthew did end the geology with Jesus, the son of Joseph. He didn't end that saying Jesus, the son of Joseph. He ended Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. This is the Aramaic way. Let me repeat again to get the point. Matthew did not end this genealogy with Jesus, the son of Joseph. But he said, Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Why did he do that? Because Matthew is so careful to let us know that even though he is telling us of Joseph's lineage, he is not the father of Jesus. Okay. By the way, in the book of Luke, we have another genealogy that is believed by many to be that of Mary. So Matthew shares the genealogy of Jesus to convince us that Jesus is indeed the son of David, a child of Abraham. He is a real man with lineage like us because he became a man. He can relate to our experiences and burdens and even temptations. Let me share the screen with you and start to read verse 17. This is important what I'm going to say. But first, I'm going to read it in Aramaic. I want you to hear the Aramaic. Klihen haikal shripta min Abram. Adma li Dawud shripta arba isre u min Dawud arba isre. Adma. Legluta de Babel, Shripta Arba Isre, Omen Gluta de Babel, Adma Limshiho, Shripta Arba Isre. Therefore, 
all the generation from Abraham down to David are 14 generations. And from David down to the Babylonian captivity, 14 generations. And from the Babylonian captivity down to Christ, for 14 generations. So I want to tell you that why 14 generations? Why Matthew in the genealogy is mentioning 14 generations three times? Because the writer does not express Matthew, his intent to reveal the 42 generations from Abraham to Jesus, but rather three segments of the Jewish history that each, each comprise of 14 generations. I want you to understand how people thought in the first century and earlier times, because it first begins with Abraham and ends with David, 14 generations. Then second begins with David and ends with Josiah, 14 generations. And then the third begins with Jer Jer Jeremiah, Jeconiah and ends with Jesus, 14 generations. So altogether 42. But the purpose of a genealogy is to document the proof of ancestry from the origin of the line to the person under discussion. So it's okay not to be precise as long as you mention the most important figures through each 14 generation, Abraham, David, and Jesus. Every individual need not to be included, all right? That's the way of writing. But only those what are necessary to establish the relationship. Because the Matthew, he wanted to establish a point or to make a point. And by the way, when you go through 14 generation to 14 generation to 14 generation, it's also an aid of memorization of ancient times. Okay. I want to give you an example. Every Aramaic letter have a number, same like Hebrew. And I want to tell you why it's so easy to memorize 14 generation. Why number 14 they chose? Remember I taught you the Aramaic language, every alphabet have a number. So Olaf or Aleph in Hebrew is one. Beth or Beit in Hebrew is two. Gomal in Aramaic or Gimel in Hebrew is three. And Dolaf is four. All right. So David, the wood in Aramaic is dolat, wow, dolat. Dolat is number four, we said. Then wow is number six letter. So here we have dolat, wow, dolat. We add four plus six is 10. We add another dolat, four is 14. So the wood itself, the numerical value is 14. So there's a relation between the genealogy and the names. The names are identity of people. So this way, it's very deep to write the genealogy in 14 generations. So thus, Matthew focused on 14 generation to emphasize that Jesus is the king and he is the son of David from the seed of Abraham. So let's continue read verse 18. Yalda din di Yeshua imshiho. Yeshua imshiho. This is the original name of Jesus, not Jesus Christ. His name is Yeshua Mshiho. Yeshua, the Savior, Yeshua Mshiho is the anointed, all right? It's not Christ. Christ is the Greek English translation, but the original Hebrew and Aramaic is Yeshua Mshiho. So, Yalda Din, the Yeshua Mshiho, Hakna, Ho Akad, Mkira, Hot Miriam, Ummo, Le Yusuf. Adla Nashtukan Ishtakhat 
بطانا من روحاد غوتشو Okay, let me read it in English. Verse 18, the birth of Jesus was in this manner, while Mary, his mother, was required for a prize for Joseph before they came together, which was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Of course, culturally, you before you get married, there is a price bought for your future wife. This is a big culture because even, even it's so important to bargain for the price. And what it says before they came together in the original Aramaic, it means they did not know each other's. And what does it mean? They don't know each other's in Aramaic, which means literally they had no sex relationship. All right. So Joseph never had an intercourse with Mary, who was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Matthew is making a point that Jesus is born out of a virgin, okay, from the Holy Spirit. Verse 19. Yusuf, Dean, Baala, Kana, Hua, Ulas Ba, then Farsi, with Rai, Hua, the Mishiat, Nshari. 19. But Joseph, her husband, was a pious man. In Aramaic, is a just man, is a good man, and did not wish to make it public. So he was thinking of divorcing her secretly. Now it's very shameful in the culture for a woman to be pregnant. And Joseph was confused, but he had a good heart. But he can't shame her, all right? So he was thinking to divorce her, all right? Because when you're engaged, before getting married, it's like you're married, you're committed. It's not like in the West, you do a contract and everyone just delete at the contract and they don't care. They wake up in the morning. I don't like her anymore or I don't like him anymore. <laughs> they leave each other. It's not like that. In the first century, in the Aramaic way of thinking till today, if you're engaged, even you shook hands with a father and you bought with a price, there's no way back. No way back. All right. You're married for life. Anyway. So look what happened next, what the Aramaic says. Kad lin din it rai it chazilo mlakan dmaraya. An angel appeared to him. Behalmo in a dream. Wa amarlo and told him, Yusef, brada wood, la tutchol lim sab, limariam, intak. Look what the English says. It's so beautiful in Aramaic. While he was considering this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said to him, O oh Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. Take your wife Mary, because he that is to be born of her is of the Holy Spirit. By the way, the language in Aramaic is different than English. The language in Aramaic says a direct order. This is the angel appeared to him in a dream and he gave him a direct order. Look what he said. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take your wife, Miriam. All right? Because he that is to be born of her is of the Holy Spirit. It's like a commandment. And this will be clear in the next verse. Taled din bra utikra Shmo Yeshua, who jir in Chio, he lamo men chatiohon. Wow. Look what it says. Shall we, she will give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. In the Aramaic now, it's more clear. 
This is a direct order from the angel, Gabriel. It's a direct order, it's a must. In English, you can't see the language, but in Aramaic, you can see it. It's a commandment. You will call him Yeshua. It's a direct order to give the name. For he shall save his people from their sins. And by the way, Yeshua in Aramaic means the Savior. Saves what? Saves people. From what? From their sins. All right? Let me explain more about it. Now, this is very important. It's very important to understand that is a direct order. All right, because everyone, when you think about Yeshua, everyone, they cast God from their own image. Every culture see him in his own image. For example, like uh, Americans see him like in a Western way of thinking, blue eyes, blonde hair. In the Middle East, we see him as, a, as like a savior, as someone who wants to bring us freedom. So every culture see Jesus in a different image. So the bottom line, we, can, we cast God in our own image. But here, here, the angel is giving direct order to Joseph, do not be afraid, and you shall call his name Yeshua. Why do you think he said that? Because here, I'm going to relate for you the genealogy of Matthew, what he's trying to tell us. He's trying to put here the historical Jesus. All right. Sorry, Andre. Now, uh, yes. The screen is black. So okay. Can just re re share. Thank you for telling me. I, mm -hmm. Here, here, Matthew is trying not to put only spiritual Jesus. You know, in the West, when you think, you think only about theological Jesus. You only think when it comes to Jesus which is great, but that's not enough to understand the real birth story or the real angel, why he's telling Joseph, call his name Yeshua, because he going to be a man, all right? That's the historical. Matthew is proving for us through the genealogy, the historical aspect of Jesus Christ. So when we think about Jesus, in order to understand and grab hold of his spirituality, we need to grab hold of his manhood. Because when you grab hold of him as a man, Yeshua, like the angel said, name him Yeshua. And by the way, Yeshua was a common name in the first century, a common Hebrew name in the first century. So it's, under, it's very important to understand that aspect, all right? So it's very important to balance between the human side and the theological side of Jesus. It both works together. And as I told you, Jesus was a man like me and like you. This is what the angel is trying to tell Joseph. Do not leave Mary. You are committed to this. And of course, after, Jesus, after Joseph received this dream and the direct order, he listened, he obeyed, and also did not change. And also later on, we see that the same angel appeared to Mary and told her the same thing, do not be afraid. All right, you name, you call his name Yeshua. As I mentioned, there are five common names in the first century in that part of the world. The first common name, of course, is Yeshua. The second common name is Yohanan. It's not John, all right? It's Yohanan. The third common name is Miriam, Miriam. And every name have a meaning. The fourth common name, is Joseph, all right? And the fifth common name is Shimon. So every name has a meaning and there is layers of meanings of the names in Aramaic and Hebrew. Let me give you one example. What do the word Joseph means? Joseph means the one who fulfill all the needs. Losif, Yosef in Aramaic is the one He's going to support the needs of this family. Shimon is the one who listens. Shmoa. Yeshua is the one who saves. So the names in scripture is the identity of people. The names is the character of the people. So when the angel is telling 
Joseph, you shall call his name Yeshua because it became his destiny. Your name is your destiny. Your name is your character. Your name is your personality and your name is calling in life. So that means a lot, all right? And also I can go deeper with the names. What is Yeshua means? Yeshua is not only the one who saves, saves what? Saves people from what? From, his, from their sins. That is calling in life. It's not only that. Yeshua can go deeper and deeper and deeper. There's different levels. Yeshua can go also Emmanuel. Emmanuel is God with us and can go deeper. It's not about the name itself, by the way. It's a common name. Jesus was a common name, but his calling was uncommon. So it's not the name itself that is holy. It's the meaning behind the name. This is the beautiful Aramaic language. It's not the name itself. It's the meaning behind that name. All right? Adam, for example. What do Adam means? Adam comes from the Aramaic. Adam, Adama, earth. So his name is his calling. He came from earth, is his identity. So any, anytime we're going to read from scripture, we're going to read about names and understand the value of the names in scripture. But let me continue because of time, continue reading and learning about the verses. Now, we write verse 22. Hada din kullu duhut dant mala mdam dat mar min maria biad nbiya all this happened that was was spoken from the lord by the prophets might be fulfilled didn't i tell you aramaic is relational matthew is building up all of this to show that messiah is king Verse 23. Dha tolta batin utlad bra when koron shmo Emmanuel demitar jam aman ilhen. This is beautiful. Behold, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. You see, it's a direct order also, Emmanuel. So it's not the name itself, Emmanuel, Im Mnawiel in Aramaic, Im Mnawiel, which means God with us. So it's not the name itself, it's the meaning behind the name, which is interpreted, our God is with us. Verse 24, Kad, Come, Dean Yusuf, Min Shnata, Abed, Aikana, Defkad Lo, Mlako, Dmaria, with Bara Lanto. When Joseph rose up from his sleep, he did just the angel of the Lord command him, and he took his wife. Obedience of faith. He obeyed. And the last verse for today. Ula hakmo adama didilto l'barro bukora ukrat shmo yeshua. Krat shmo yeshua. His name, Jesus, yeshua. And he did not know her until gave birth to her firstborn son, and she called his name Jesus. Now, and he did not know her. What does it mean, he did not know her? In Aramaic, literally means they did not have a sexual relationship. That's literally. When you know someone, it's relational, all right? So it's so clear that Yeshua, Matthew, want to tell us that Yeshua, he was the firstborn to Mary. 
And the angel, not his mom, not his dad, the angel called his name Yeshua. So there was a calling on the life of Jesus even before his birth. 